All right, and welcome back to part two of our Introduction to R series. And so we've been to the last lecture, which you should definitely go watch, on what are object types, right? So matrices, lists, data frames, vectors. And what I want to do now is move on to just kind of like, what, how do I work and learn things? And so then we'll get into like working directories and packages. So you can see we're here like kind of right here in the middle of this section um, where I probably should have talked about converting to object types in the last lecture, but that's all right. And then we'll get into subsetting, working files, that kind of stuff. Okay, I just wanted to break it up because it was getting to be an hour long and that's too long for everyone. Okay. And so I do want to make this very important note that I think is difficult for people at the beginning is we know that we've opened penguins, right? So our penguin data set is something we opened in the last lecture and it's in our what's called working environment. So I know that I have penguins open in my environment, right? And I know that there's a variable in it called species. And so it's very tempting to just type species in your console and have it know, like there's only one species here. Why can't it find it? I can see it, it's right here, right? Where is it? Why can't it find that? Okay. And so what I wanna encourage the use of is the ls function. Okay, so um, in this particular slide deck, I have already run these ABCD thing. I don't think I've rerun it over here in my console that's open, um, but ls will just list everything that you can possibly call directly. Okay. And that's really useful if you're like, why, why can't you find this? Maybe I have a typo, um, maybe I just can't remember that species is in the penguins data set. So you can see I have, um, I can't use species because it's not available here in the list of things in my environment. You can also use that on a particular data set. So LS penguins tells me that's where species is. So why this data set, okay, not that one. Why have we been doing penguins dollar sign species this whole time? Well, that's because you have to tell it. It's in the penguins data set and it's a column called species. But the super cool thing about um, Studio here is that if you have that open and you start typing, it will, kind of fill in like, is this what you want? You can hit tab and go, yeah, that's what I want. So then I can um, hit the dollar sign and now it's gonna grab the list of possible names and show you what you can pick from. So there's a little bit of like filling in information that'll help you find that piece that you're looking for. It's also a similar um, piece to uh, functions and some of the options available in functions, but we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay. All right. So the LS function, if you don't want to like take the time to look at the environment, you just want to print it out. This is currently what I could use. So I only have X, Y, and penguins at the moment. Now, when I was running this uh, set of slides, I had these other things open. And so I can convert, start to convert between these object types. And most of those functions are as, dot, and then something else. So quick, let's look. How many as functions are there? So I'm gonna use as, dot, and then you can see that it pulled up all these options. There are a bunch, as array, as character, as character factor, as character hex, as complex. I mean, it goes on for quite some time before it finally switches to some other packages, but there are a lot of conversion functions. As you can see, I'm still scrolling. Okay, and then it finally stops. So I can convert between all these different object types. We've only talked about four of them, really. Um, okay, so we just did that, but you have to be careful. Okay. So I made a new data frame by saying, okay, I'm gonna do as data frame and combine X and Y. So in the last lecture, we looked at X and Y as a column. So this makes a data frame of um, two columns, X and Y with five things in them each, so it's a five rows by two variables data frame. Okay. And let's say, and so I can convert that essentially from being into two vectors into one data frame. Here's the uh, be careful part. So let's say I have a, a vector 
of characters. You know the characters because they're in quotes. So one, two, and I have to put three in quotes because I can't mix and match. All right, so this is a character data frame. And I want to try to convert it into a number. Okay, and that's where we get this warning. Like it doesn't know what the word one means. And so it's like, mm, I don't know. And so it makes them into NAs. So you have to be careful converting between types. And there are special types of date objects. And to me, these are the most difficult ones to work with and convert between. Okay, because dates have to be structured very specifically, which is why they're not covered in this lecture. That's a whole different 45 minute lecture on dates. And that leads me into subsetting. So subsetting to me is a critical, critical thing because you first have to understand how objects work. So that's why we spend time going over data frames and lists and vectors to understand how to get the things you want out of them. Because I mean, at heart, I'm a statistician. I would love to get the specific analysis piece that I need out of this code saved variable. So subsetting is, or sometimes called slicing if you're more of a Python person, is where you grab specific rows or columns or pieces of a list given some criteria. We already talked about how to select them using the row, comma, column formatting or the dollar sign operator. But now we can really get going by saying, you know what, give me only certain things that meet a specific logical criteria or only missing data or only complete data. So now I can start to really filter down. So this is going to be kind of like using, click a button here, this filter option. So I can say, you know what, give me only Dream Island. So we're going to look at how code-wise I could do that same thing. Because if I type, you know, click on the buttons up here, that does not actually do anything to the data frame. So that doesn't resave this data set where it's only the Dream options. It just visually shows you that. What if I wanted a data set that only was saved that way? So let's look at that. And so how does a logical operator work? Well, it analyzes, depending on how you do this, rows or columns for that logical question. Is this missing? Yes or no. Is it above 75? Yes or no. So a logical question can be answered with true or false. And in this first example that I'm going to show you down here, we're asking, is this specific variable, bill length, so length of our penguins here, greater than 54? Okay. Now, it can be any question that makes sense with that data set. And so we're going to ask it, you know, is bill length greater than 54? But show me the entire data frame where bill length is greater than 54. And so what it does is, um, look at each data piece and then say yes or no and you only get the yeses back and then a quick note to be careful where you put the comma so or where you put the logical operator so let's look at some examples to hopefully clear this up so here i would say give me rows one and two okay remember rows are first and so it gave me the entire row one and two now Give me the penguins data set okay, where bill length here is greater than 54. And you don't need this space. I just like to do the space to help me see. Um, so penguins dollar sign bill length. We talked about that as the vector, a specific column in the data set where that instance is greater than 54. And so how this works is I just printed this out by itself, not embedded in this data frame code. And you can see hopefully now what it's doing. For every single row, it decided false, false, NA, can't decide, data set's missing that data piece, false, 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 so many falses, and then some trues down here at the end. So it only gave me back the trues, so it gave me nine rows back. So there are only nine penguins in this data set that have a bill length greater than 54 or have missing data and it can't decide. So subsetting this way does return missing data. Excuse me. Now I need to make sure I put this before the column, um, before the comma rather, because I'm interested in examining the data by rows. If you want to examine the data by columns, you have to do it after the comma. Okay? 
So our understanding, remember rows first and then columns. And this looks at specifically at that column and returns all the rows. Okay, or I'm sorry, returns the rows that meet that criteria and shows you all the columns because it's blank. Okay, so let me just say that one more time. Any row that meets this criteria, all the columns because there's no rules written on this side. You can combine these together. So let's print this out, right? Same thing we just saw. Now let's say, you know what? I don't want all these columns. Let's just look at where they live. So just give me the island column back. Now I can't combine these together, you know? Okay, I'm sorry, I need the island and what gender they are. So sex. And so we're starting to see that you can create complex arguments to grab only small pieces of the data set. Now I haven't saved any of this data, I'm just telling it to print. And so since I am seeing output, it is not saving. So my penguins data set is unaffected. So you'll see it's still the big data set, but I could save this as a smaller data frame. So I can use it later. And so now in our data, we can see I have this extra small one that's only our long build penguins in only the island and sex columns. I could also overwrite the original, but that would make these slides very weird in a minute. So we're not going to do that. All right. I can get even more complex. Okay. So I could say, okay, penguins who have a bill length of 54 and a bill depth greater than 17. And so that actually filters the data set down to five rows. So this little and operator here means this and that. You can use the or operator, which is a pipe, which on a QWERTY keyboard is shift and then the one above the enter key, the back um, backslash. So let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, so here's the original. It's seven rows, or I'm sorry, five rows. And then I can switch this to the pipe, which is the or this or that which now gives us 196 rows. Okay. So um, pipe is or and is both. Uh, there are other operators like greater than and equal to. So instead of just greater than, I can do also equal to. Um, I could do equal specifically, which is two equal signs, not equal to, which is um, exclamation point equals. So if you ever need to know kind of what logical operators are, that is the thing to Google. So logical operators in R. And that'll get you a list of these options. Fun rules. I can do everything but. So I can say negative one. That drops the first column. So give me all the columns but number one. Okay, so I can do negative one through two. So all the columns but one and two. And I use this a lot when I am um, working on cleaning a data set where I need to break data frames into different pieces. We can also grab columns by name. Now I set it to a separate variable here and you don't have to, you could just type this piece here, right here. But sometimes it helps me to, if I separate them out because it can get quite long, but I can say, okay, only give me these two columns. It's still a data frame or a tibble, but now it's just a smaller tibble than before. Now, another base R function is subset. Okay, if you're using more tidyverse and dplyr, uh, you might use filter. These work the same way. So subset is one of my favorite functions, all time favorite function, probably summary because it's such a good workhorse, um, but subset's really handy. And it's a little easier than some of these square bracket things because I can use the same rules. And so I can say, okay, penguins, I only want bill links greater than 54. And so give me back seven rows, but notice the NAs are gone. So before when we subsetted um, here, right, it gave me nine rows, oh, sorry, clicking is hard. It gave me nine rows back because it left in the NAs. And so I always like to point out that both of these approaches are valid, but they give you slightly different answers. 
The other thing you'll notice here is we had to define the entire structure. So I had to say in the penguins data set, look at penguins bill length, etc. And sometimes my students are like, well, I told it it's the penguins data frame. Why do I got to define it again? I'm like, you just do. <laughs> but the subset function um, says, here's the data frame. Now we can use just the column name here. But the nice thing about subset is you're actually not limited to just the column names. You can actually use a separate external variable to subset, which if you are watching this for my structural equation modeling class, we'll do in the next lecture. Okay. Um, another function this really is really pretty great and dplyr is filter. Okay. All right. Let's deal with missing values now because we've already seen that two of our functions handle them in different ways. So a missing value is marked with NA. When they print out, sometimes they have the little uh, greater than and less than symbols next to them, but you know, visually they say NA. Okay. And NA is actually come up in a specific color. So if it's a tibble, they kind of come up in red. <laughs> it's a warning. I don't remember what data frames do. Do they? I think they come up. Let's look. If it'll let me type over here. So tibbles have fancy formatting. Data frames just say NA. Okay. They have the little brackets around them when they're a factor. Okay. When they're a numeric, they just say NA, but they're treated the same way in the background. Okay. If you see NAN, that stands for not a number, which doesn't actually automatically convert to a missing variable. So you can get not a number by doing something divided by zero. It does not like that. Oh, it gives me infinity. How do I get not a number? I forget. Um, there are ways to do this. Can I do this? Unexpected. Well, there's ways to get not a number because I did it earlier today, but now I can't remember. But just remember that does not stand for missing data. That stands for not a number. Okay. Most functions have this kind of option for excluding NA values, but they can be slightly different and they all act slightly differently. And so I will um, show you some examples at the very end of this lecture. Now there's this cool function called complete cases and complete cases creates a logical variable and it tells you if a data frames row is complete. So is that row got data in every single spot or does it have a missing value? I use the head function here to only print out a small number. So the head function prints out the first six rows of something, the first six items of something, um, just to keep this code not so long. Uh, but the function I want to highlight here is complete cases. So complete cases really creates a logical vector. So you can use it in subsetting to um, only get a row that has got no missing values. NAOMIT is a popular function as well that instead just grabs the rows with complete cases. So what NAOMIT does is it looks at complete cases and grabs only the truths. The end is in a function. It's slightly different. It runs on only a vector. So I don't, I can't really apply it to a data frame because it's dimensional. So is in a wants one, a vector, one row or one column, but it then also returns a logical. So is it missing or not? Yes or no. And I use this one a lot to help me tally up how many missing pieces are in a data frame because then I can exclude them. Okay, so we'll stop with missing data and we'll come back to it as we talk about functions. So how do I exclude missing data? Well, if I want to just get rid of everything kind of quickly, I can just say penguins equals penguins, uh, NA omit penguins. So I just save it as a new data frame with no missing data. Okay. Um, if I want to exclude it kind of piecemeal, one piece at a time, we can talk about how to integrate that into the function you're trying to run. But temporarily, I'm going to switch to more some more global topics um, that are key for understanding how to work um, in R. And I think working directories, honestly, is one of the more confusing pieces because there are many people who have computers who don't understand where files are saved. Um, and I have files and files and files. So a working directory is where you're currently trying to look for a file. So you've got this data set, your instructor says, import this file. And you're like, where is it on my computer, right? 
And so for many students, this is the downloads folder because <laughs> everything is in downloads. And I'm such a type A person that I'm like, oh my God, I can't stand, I can't handle it. <laughs> I like having data structure, right? Um, but for me, this is in my um, teaching folder for my structural equation modeling class. These are my updated notes because this is my new version of the course in this intro folder. So I have it stored away. And the working directory is kind of where you're telling it to look. If you want to know what your working directory is, you can just type git wd. Okay, so what, where, where are you looking for this file? Now, <clears throat> I could also tell it to look specifically in this folder. And for a long time, this was my habit. Look in this folder. And I find this to be fairly error prone because it's hard to sometimes explain to people where folders are on their computer. And if you move them, this whole system breaks down. And so instead, I'm really going to recommend um, using uh, markdown files or what are called projects to, and that's what this line says, to help automate this process. Because a working directory tells it where to look, right, for a specific file. And you don't want to have to use the options if you want to get serious about doing coding. You don't want to have to like use the point and click options, which I'm about to show you every time you open a file. Okay. Uh, instead, you want to tell it, here's the working directory and let's move on. But then I could even create a system that I don't even have to tell it's the working directory. I open that file and it knows like, hey, this is where we're going to look first. Okay. So let me explain what I mean by, by point and click options first. So let's say I want to import a data set. And that's in the environment window. So I can click import data set. We'd pick an option here. And then it's going to open this up file choose window. Okay. Now, if I want to automate my process, that part's not automated. Right? I can't, um, I'd have to point and click every time. Now, I could save the code. And so the nice thing about the import window is you can look at it. But once you get used to this, this is actually kind of more like just open the file. <laughs> okay, click import. Now it does actually show me the code. So I can copy this code and put it into my script. Okay. But if I ever move this file or this folder, because at some point these lectures won't be the updated ones anymore, they will be the lectures. And so I can move them out of my updated folder. I have to recreate and move all of those and change all of those directories. Instead, what I'd recommend is using markdown files okay, or a project. Okay. And I think really explaining markdowns and project, the separation between those is a little bit out of the scope of this lecture and I don't want to be too overwhelming, but basically when you create a markdown file like this one, not only can I type my notes to myself to remind myself in a year when I open this up again, uh, what I was doing and then also run code the added bonus of markdown files is wherever they are saved. So it is currently saved in this folder. You can see it right here. It will automatically look for the data in that same folder. So I don't have to remember where this is on my computer. As long as they are in the same folder, it will automatically assume that that's where you want to look. Okay. Projects work in a very similar way. Projects are allow you to kind of combine a bunch of different folders. Um, so a markdown will still look, a markdown within a project will still look in that specific folder. But projects are really like allow you to kind of create um, a bunch of structured data together. So I have a project for my course because I have a bunch of folders for it. Okay. But because I have this markdown document in this folder, it will look in that folder first for the data. And if you want to use the point and click options, go for it. I'm just saying like, as you get better, uh, consider using these options that automate that working directory thing for you. Because I find uh, students find that very confusing. Okay. And so that leads me into importing files. There are so many ways to import files. It's unbelievable and amazing. <laughs> and so you can use what, what I'm going to call base R, meaning I've installed nothing else. So uh, some famous ones, read lines, read.csv is the function. I can use tidyverse, which is read underscore CSV. 
or I can use the option I just showed you, import data set, click, find the file, or I could show you some magic. That is one function in a separate library that you have to install, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we're getting there, um, that pretty much automates this process. So one problem that I've had as I've, I've gotten better at this, moving away from CSV documents, right, which are comma separated files, is maybe I have this data set in Excel, which is a special type of document, or maybe I have this data set in an SPSS format because my friends haven't changed over yet. Maybe it's in tab format. Maybe it's just a bunch of lines of text. And you gotta remember, which function do I use? Is it read Excel? Which library is that in? Which, where, where is it? So what I've found is there's an extra package that we can add on to R, which is kind of like adding um, uh, an extension, right? Or if you're used to phones, like a new app, okay, that pretty much like automates most of this. If Rio added PDF import, it would be the most magic, beautiful package in existence, although it's pretty close already. Okay. The function is called import, okay. pretty obvious. And then you put in the name of the data set. <clears throat> okay. Notice how I have just the name of the data set here and there are no extra pieces to what's called the path. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All this stuff, I don't have to put that in there. Like we saw over here a minute ago. Sorry, let's look at this, right? When I did read.csv here, which is the base R function, it added all that extra stuff. Okay, I don't have to do that because this is a markdown document. And so it knows, just look in the folder you're in. That's fine. Cool. So import the CSV file. It figures it out. It grabs, it figures out what function to import it with. It figures out if it's got a header or not. Um, it figures out like all the extra stuff that you normally have to tell R manually. I have found that it only messes up like every so many small, very specific instances. It is magic. So I can import a .xlsx or .sav. Now, key piece here, make sure it's spelled exactly the same. Okay, so you do have to map that onto the file name that is listed in that folder. That's what we've got here is a data set that I use for my first assignment. Okay, Rio is magic. And so what is a package? So I've been talking about libraries and packages. What are, what are, what are those things? So these are extra functionality that um, some people call packages, some people call libraries. Most people call them packages when you install them and libraries when you're using them. They're basically the same thing. Um, the idea here is these are extra bells and whistles. Okay, base R is what R comes with when you install it, which is actually several packages. Things like tidyverse, that's multiple packages. Um, or uh, Rio are extra packages that people have written. You can grab those from CRAN, which is the official repository using install.packages okay, as your typed code. You can also install them by using the packages tab, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then other people write code that they don't really put on CRAN like myself, and you can install them directly from GitHub. I tell you to start with packages on CRAN, but you might see some people saying, well, install it this other way. And they're still valid packages. Um, they just haven't gone through the procedure to get them officially listed. Okay. And so this is how you might install the car package. Okay. And what if you want to do this uh, sort of manually, because package installation is not something I'd really recommend putting in like a markdown document. I actually have it set where it's not running that code. Okay. So I told it like, don't actually install this because I have it on my computer already. Um, so when I install packages, I often use the point and click option, but you can click packages, click install, and you can type the name of the package. So pretty popular package, imbes, okay, for effect sizes, mass is one of the most used packages. And so I'd click and say, yep, yeah, install that bad boy. I will do that now, but that's how you can install them. You can also see all the packages you have installed. So system library is most of the base R functions. And then if you go down to the very bottom, you will also get a, um, on some computers, it will separate out user library. 
so um, things that you have installed and that's more for computers with multiple users and so I have the car package installed which is a regression package now now we can see what's installed in our packages window now every time you go through a major R update so as you go from like 4.0 to 4.1, 4.2, you usually have to reinstall packages because it saves that version of R in a different folder and it looks in a different place. So those packages are still on your computer, it just is not looking for them in that spot anymore. That's useful and annoying, so you often have to reinstall packages when you upgrade, which is okay, because then you can delete the old ones. <laughs> um, every time, now, now this, this line, super important, Every time you restart R, you have to reload packages. Okay. Close R Studio, you open it back up, it's forgotten all the libraries you have open, unless you tell it to save the environment, which I don't recommend. Okay. Um, so this, I think, is something people don't totally get to, is that when you um, open R, it will only load a couple of things and that's a memory saver so it doesn't have like 700 all 700 packages open I mean look at how many packages I have so many and I just upgraded too <laughs> so I have a bunch if it opened all of these at once they would interact in ways unpleasantly because sometimes packages have uh, two different packages have the same function names and it can get confused uh, so it saves me the time and energy and doesn't open everything at once which is good Instead, I'm gonna tell it just the ones I wanna work with right now. And so every time I reopen R, I have to tell it, reopen these packages. So I always recommend putting that library code right at the top of your scripts. And in uh, many of my updated assignments for classes, that's the first block I have, import all of your libraries. Okay. Not only does that help a user know what you're using if you're sharing your code, but also can help you remember, hey, I gotta install this package. And so you'll see, oh, and this is like the one one that doesn't happen in it. But in my other packages, I, I do have, my other scripts, I do tend to do that. Let's see if I did it in this one. So no, of course not. <laughs> so in other cases I do in like homeworks and my own uh, research work. Okay. Not in my lectures apparently. <laughs> so I'm gonna preach it, but I don't have it done. Uh, so how do I load a library? Um, you type library car. So this is a confusion too. It's called a package when you install it and a library when it's there. Don't know why, but um, library car, open up a car. So then it'll be open for you to use all of its functions. Okay. So let's say, let's, I don't think I have car open. Car has a really cool function called recode. So if I'm typing recode, I might not find it. Like, where is this? Like, it, what? Where is this function? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna preview of something here where I can look up. No, no, no. Do not autofill. Thank you. I can look up a function, see if I can remember where it's at, and I can say, okay, maybe it's not recode, but relevel. Let's look relevel. Okay. Oh, that's in stats. So you can see, like, as I'm typing functions, I can kind of see where they're at. Until I load the library, I cannot find that function. So now I can see recode. So you can tell if it's open because the functions won't work. So when students <laughs> had issues, my first two questions, did you spell it right? Did you load the library? And you will forget to do it. I forget to load libraries all the time, and I have been doing this for a while. Okay. So now I've got the library loaded, and it um has told me oh by the way i'm also loading this other side piece okay. so if packages have what are called dependencies other packages they rely on it will also load them at the same time so things like ggplot that require some extra stuff in the background it will quietly tell also load those for you so we've talked a lot about functions so let's end this lecture on what is a function <laughs> okay so functions are those pre-written codes that help you run analyses, that help you do stuff, right? And I, the best way to learn functions is just to use them wrong and get the help. Okay? And so there's two options here. You can either do question mark and the name of the function, 
If it can find it, it will tell you. If it can, it'll tell you, try double question marks or help in the name of the function. So let's do recode now that I have that open. And if it has good documentation, which yeah, who knows, um, car does, it will pop up here in the help window. And so this help window gives me a lot of information. So one of my favorite packages, Psych, is really great on the documentation, but it tells you a little bit about what, what does recode do? Well, it helps you recode factor names. How do you use it? What are the arguments? So you have to give it a variable. You have to give it how you're gonna recode. And then some other ones. And then some more details. So it's a, this one's really greatly documented. It has a lot of information, tells you who the author is, what the value is, and then gives you some examples. I could also have just done help, recode. Uh, let's do LM as a different example. So this is a base R function. And so it's got all the information about what happens when you run LM. It goes on for quite a while. And that will help you learn, hopefully, a little bit more how to use the function if you're having trouble. The other thing that I really love is this args function that tells me what the arguments are. And so arguments are a set piece of things in the order it expects them in. So with LM, I could type simply like this. So I'm just gonna fall back on MT cars here because I know that one by heart. Okay, and so you notice that I've done it in, um, in order. So I know the formulas first, I put formula here and I know the data seconds and put data here and it'll return some output. Or I could define those arguments and put them in a different order if I wanted to. Alan, it's okay if you don't totally understand because this is outside this lecture, but um, and I, I like telling students when they start to define what argument it is because then you don't have to get them in the right order. Right? So I could do it this way and get the same output or I can screw up and not remember what order they go in. Do it this way. Ooh, that count with the penguins thing. So I can put them in the wrong order. But args really helps me, and I type this one a lot, just to know, like, what am I going to define again? Right? What are, what are the rules? Now you'll often see this dot, 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 and that just means there are more things that you can put in there, but you don't have to. So I minimally actually have to define these two, but there are other additional arguments. And you'll know when you haven't defined one, because it'll tell you that something's missing, um, if they've written their code well. Um, but this args one just helps me remember what I'm supposed to be doing. Now the tab function, I'm sorry, um, the little yellow box here can get brought back up like if you accidentally hit escape. I think if you hit, um, sometimes you can kind of back up and get it to come back up. Or if you just are like, I can't get it to come back up, uh, type args so you can see it again. Okay. It's the same thing that is listed usually here under arguments. So this explains more what all those things are. You can also use example and it, it kind of runs sort of awkwardly, but it shows you an example and actually runs it in the, the, the environment. So it's saved output for you. And it's the same example that it's at, <clears throat> excuse me, the bottom of the help, which for LM is quite long. Um, here is actually running this code just so you can see what an example looks like. And I find those to be really handy to know what kind of what to do with a function. I could also write my own function. So I give it a name, I'm gonna call it pizza because it's dinner time. And then you type function. So this is the function to define functions, a little meta, meta for your day. Um, and then the arguments I want. So I only want one X, but I could have multiples. So I could say, okay, I need X, Y, and Z. And then you define what the function does inside the square brackets. So our pizza function here um, squares a number, because okay, that's a pretty simple function. If you're watching the data screening lecture next as part of my SIM course, 
you will find that we will define a function to calculate the percent missing. Because that's something that's like kind of missing from base R. So let's just calculate our own. How many NAs are in a data set, in a row, or in a column? And we'll write our own little function for that. Um, and then you run your function the same way that you have run every other function. So, P sorry, pizza here. I pass the argument. I could say x equals 3, and that will give me 9. If I did 4 here, it would give me 16, etc. Now I just want to show off a couple example functions that I think are quite useful. Okay, the first one being table. Table is a function I use probably every day where you can, you can put any type of data in the table, but you really need it to be a vector. You can put a data frame in a table, but it will warn you that that's a bad idea. So instead, just put a vector in. Okay. So I've got our species. Well, how many in our penguins data set are of each species? Okay. And it calculates what's called a frequency table. Okay. Now the table function does exclude any NA values unless you tell it to not. So just kind of a warning that this is not every data piece that's there, it's every non-missing data piece. I've already um, sung the praises of the summary function, but a summary on a single vector that is a number will give you some really nice basic descriptive statistics. Okay, min, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, max. So it tells you kind of like the distribution of, this, of the data, if it's numeric, and how many missing data pieces there are. They could just throw in standard deviation. This would be one of the most magic functions. Um, but the summary of an entire data frame actually calculates different things for different columns. And then I just want to finally pause on this idea of dealing with missing data and a function. Okay. And so I know there are missing data pieces here in my bill length because I got some NAs, right? If I try to calculate the mean, so calculating the mean is easy, it's the mean function. You put in a vector of data, not a data frame, vector only. If there are any missing values, it will automatically return NA. Well, let's see why. Like, oh, it's so confusing, right? Because there's a mean. So if I look at the description for mean, it has this option, NARM. Okay. And NARM is should I remove the NAs? So this is like NA omit, except it's asking you a question. Should you remove the NAs? A logical value indicating whether or not NAs should be stripped before. Okay. Now, it doesn't quite make it clear in the usage section here, but NA remove, uh, the default is false. So we didn't tell it what to do, and so it assumed that we meant don't remove them. And since we didn't remove them, hey, I don't know what to do. I can't add in a values or um, make a mean of NA values. The solution to that, if this is what you want to do, is to remove them. Okay. That does not remove them from the data set, just temporarily removes them and calculates the mean score. So the mean bill length is 43, just like we see over here. Okay, we can just see with full precision more decimals. Now here's another example, and this is on my intro R assignment if you are following along. I want you to calculate correlation table on some specific columns. So first rule here is the subsetting. Let's only grab these three columns because correlations can only be calculated on numeric data. So I don't want to give it um, categorical data or it will be mad at me. Okay. So this data set here is just some numeric columns. The correlation function is pretty easy. Core, give it uh, at least two columns or more, so we can give it two or 200. And what you'll get back is a little uh, matrix of the correlation of each item with itself, so perfectly correlated with itself, and then darn it, it gave us a bunch of NAs. And this is where I want to highlight. The way that functions deal with NAs are different for each function sometimes. So many functions use this NARM, core does not. It has this use option, because there are a couple of ways that you can treat in correlations. Uh, pairwise complete ofs means give me the correlation between each column where there's data. Um, there's also complete ofs that says only the complete cases, which we talked about that function before. And so now I've got my correlation table, um, excluding the NNAs. 
And the way you can figure out which one, which option you want is to just do question mark core. Okay. And the help guides are pretty awesome. Okay, so here are the options. Everything, all OBS, complete OBS, NA or complete, and pairwise complete. Okay. And then it explains what those all are a little bit better down here. So the documentation here is good. You will have packages where the documentation isn't great. It happens. <clears throat> So some other descriptive functions that you might use in like your sort of intro week of statistics might be co for, for covariance, var for variance, sd for standard deviation, scale for z-scoring, and um, I teach statistics so I like to teach these but obviously if you're going to use this for more code purposes there are lots of lots and lots and lots of cool functions uh, like apply but we'll cover apply in a different lecture. So let's sum everything up across these two lectures. What have you learned? Okay. Some basic programming terminology, object types. What is a matrix? What is a vector? What is a character? Right? What is a logical? Some specific R defaults, right? So some specific R things like R is a one index language. Um, NARM is often false. Okay. And then we just did some example functions and use cases. Okay. Now, how do you actually learn this stuff? Practice. So take things like swirl stats, um, practice with a goal in mind. What are you trying to learn how to do? I often find that it's hard for people who just like, I wanna learn insert language name, right? It's easier if you have a goal. I wanna learn how to make a plot. Right? And then that's easier to Google, right? So ggplot is one of the most popular plotting packages. It's really great, it's ggplot2, sorry. Um, I have been coding R for at least five years now or more at the time of this recording. I still Google how to do things in this in ggplot. <laughs> so it has a lot of options. I can't always remember the code off the top of my head, so I look it up. But um, so I'm trying to say is you may not ever totally learn every exact thing to type, but you've learned at least how to get to the answer you're wanting to. So have a goal in mind. I learned R because I wanted to run an analysis that I could not run in SPSS anymore. And then I figured out all the cool things that I could do with it. And for me, it became an issue of reproducible science. So I can take my analyses and go, here you go, run it yourself. Um, so that became one of my goals. So I learned how to use Markdown and I learned all these extra cool functions. And then I've joined the community and um, really tried to expand my skill set that way. In classes, I teach people to a specific goal. So our next lecture is on data screening. How do I do data screening? We're gonna learn a bunch of new functions um, and a specific set of rules for data screening. And the more of those kind of goals that you set for yourself and little practice problems that you have, uh, the more flexible, flexible you can become. Because yeah, the first time I did it, I learned it was data screening, but I could take apply and use it in multiple places. So I think it always helps if you have some specific tangible goal because it can be very overwhelming to just learn a language instead learn how to do a task and there are lots of cool things like tidy Tuesdays where people have a specific task and you can learn how to do um, specific instances there are little practice examples there are plenty of people who write tutorials um, so that's where I'd recommend getting started and then practice I have this open every day it's also my job, but that's how I've learned, is I've practiced every day for a long time. So it's okay if you get frustrated. I get frustrated. It's cool if you can't get it right. I can't spell. So we're all in the same boat together. So ask questions um, in the YouTube or send me an email and I'll do my best to answer them.